Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! No! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic championship. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. If you love the games, we are the show for you. Each week we share stories from athletes and people behind the scenes to help you have more fun watching the games. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? I thought I was going to have to play the doping sounder on myself again. Oh, no. Because moved my daughter into college this weekend, like so many people across the country, and helping her unpack, I smacked my ankle against a big Pyrex dish that I had stupidly put on the floor as I was unwrapping it. Didn't hurt that much when it happened, because you know the adrenaline of the event. (laughs) But as I was driving home, of course, it's my right ankle. And as I'm driving home, I'm thinking, this really hurts. And I got home and it was a little swollen. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to need some assist from the physio here. So I used to bath it and it's just a bruise. No serious injuries. I won't have to miss the finals. I'm OK. I'm glad of that. But if you do ingest some substances, please do check because the podcast urine sampling team will be on your doorstep in no time. I know. I was afraid I was going to get in trouble because I was late coming home, you know, so the whereabouts uh, (laughs) information was not accurate, but it's okay. Nobody showed up at my door. Shoo. All right. Well, it is Labor Day weekend in the U.S., so we have Movie Club, which I'm very excited about Movie Club this time. We also have a visit from uh, Shuk Vastani coming along, so that is exciting as well, and we have a big announcement in the show later on as well and we have a big announcement for the show but first film buff fran is back this time with a promise kept the oksana Bayul story this made for tv movie tells the story of the 1994 figure skating gold medalist take a listen to our conversation movie club fran welcome back we are talking a promise kept the oksana Bayul story what do you got for us Well, this movie was released in November of 1994, so pretty immediately after the Olympics in Lillehammer that same year, and it depicts the life, the early life of Oksana Bayul, who was the gold medal winner in ice skating at the 94 Games. It depicts her very sad early childhood where We see her as a young child, and she's living with her mom and dad and her grandmother. However, her father right away is shown as kind of like a deadbeat dad and disappears. And so it's really just the saga of her, her mom, and her grandmother. Uh, Although in real life, with some digging that I made, she actually did have both grandparents. So I don't know why they didn't depict both of them in the movie. But anyway, and it shows her early start in skating. And obviously, from what was depicted in the story, she had that kind of spark and that kind of competitor spirit that made people stand up and say, we want to work with her. And we want to train her. And she did really well. And unfortunately, her mother came down with ovarian cancer when she was training. They didn't really say at what age she passed in the movie, but she had a brief illness and passed away. And then the movie really didn't, it kind of glossed over that part of the saga. I mean, it made it look like she leapt into staying with her coach, who she had a very warm and good relationship with. But she kind of went from couch to couch. She just kind of was a nomad. And we see how she trained and who she interacted with up until the Lillehammer games. All in all, I felt looking back on it, you know, I was thinking about the title of the movie, A Promise Kept. and, And it really kind of felt to me they really centered on 
the relationship she had with her mother, not so much on her Olympic journey, you know, and that was shown by what they decided to show and what they didn't decide to show. I mean, they didn't do any Olympic footage, fake or real. You know, I don't know because this was a made for television movie, if it was just done just because of the budget, or did they just not feel like that was the story they were telling because there was a lot of vignettes where she is by herself and she's just talking to her mom when she was already passed. So she was kind of keeping her memory alive. So it was a little disappointing for me because being an Olympics fan and being an ice skating fan, I wanted to see a lot of skating (laughs) and they really didn't do much. And really the best skating in the movie was, spoiler alert, at the end when the real Oksana actually came on and performed her short program from the Olympics at the end of the story. How about you guys? What did you think of the movie? I'll bury the lead, Fran. Made for TV. Oh my gosh. (laughs) 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 Made for TV. And it was the movie that Oksana gave her blessing to and she and Victor Petrenko Ah. were heavily and I'm sure they were heavily involved they had credits at the end this was so sanitized it felt like and schmaltzy and low budget oh my Mm -hmm. goodness oh and the acting ranged from Miguel Ferrer (laughs) to of course people you don't know but really stilted acting really really poor writing stilted writing these poor actors had to deliver these horrible lines but it was in that way it was fantastic but I was with you like we did not see much ice skating at all in this movie it was unbelievable and we didn't really even see much of what would pass for the Ukraine I right. Say. <laughs> I it mean, was filmed in uh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> I know, which is not far off because the opening scene, like they're walking into a brick, like two flat. And I'm like, where are they? Jersey? It, was, <laughs> it looked n- and it was spacious, a ginormous apartment for what eventually became three people living there. It looked nothing like you would think a Soviet depiction. So everything from the get go is so far off. Mm-hmm. what you would really see and it's just like oh they dressed up a pittsburgh hockey rink with a picture of lenin and a couple of soviet <laughs> flags <you know? laughs> and then to make it the national one they added gorby to the you know? <laughs> yeah, one of the things i thought they were the sloppiest about was when was it the soviet union and when was it ukraine they totally glossed over the entire collapse of the government mm-hmm. during this time the entire collapse of the support of the sports system. Mm-hmm. You know, early on in the movie, Miguel Ferrer shows up, who is usually a villain in so many things. And here he was quite paternal and, mm. and not at all like the typical Soviet coach mm-hmm. we've seen in so many mm-hmm. other movies mm-hmm. and saying, don't worry, the state is going to pay for that. And by 94, that system had completely collapsed and a lot of athletes were struggling Mm -hmm. to figure out and ice rinks weren't being taken care of, but that didn't exist in this movie. Right. Nothing truly unpleasant beyond her personal life existed in this movie. So Ukraine, which is quite lush when it's not being destroyed by the Russian military, you know, it is the breadbasket of Europe. But this looked particularly green. And you don't think of Soviet Ukraine as green and blossoming and everybody's happy and kind Uh. of family-like. And you think the state is lovely. And like you said, the apartment was huge and quite elaborately decorated for a divorced French French teacher teacher who's supporting her child and her parents. Because like you said, her grandfather, Oksana's grandfather, was alive and died a year prior to her grandmother, but he didn't exist in this movie. And it was weird with the child to Oksana as a child, because I had a hard time trying to follow the chronology because she didn't appear the right age at some points. Cause I'm like, okay, I know she got the medal, the gold medal at 16, but she looked older way before that. 
you know, so I'm like, okay, well, when did, you know, she was on the bus at one point and her little boyfriend, Yuri, was sitting next to her. And I'm just like, she's kissing him. How old is she? I'm not <laughs> understand. <laughs> like, where are we here? So. Right. And with grandma, when Oksana is a toddler, grandma can barely get up the stairs without huffing and puffing and almost collapsing. But four years later, she grandma skating on the ice in her babushka and toting her purse. I thought she was. I thought she was going to do a double axle for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for for a grandmother who supposedly had never been on skates before, <laughs> she was moving. She was cruising and balancing that enormous handbag. <laughs> she was my that, favorite. That and the poor actress who played Oksana. Everybody did their best with the material they had to work with, but she looked particularly American to me. Mm. In a healthy, robust way. <laughs> you know, I know. Oksana had... was a petite girl. Like, this girl was so, right. not that she was heavy, but she was more robust figure-wise. I remember Oksana at the Olympics, and she was like the, this little bird, you know? Yes. Oksana at the Olympics looked like she hadn't gone through puberty. Mm -hmm. and, she, and I don't mean that in a sarcastic way. I mean that in a serious way. She looked small, About young. 12 or 13, she had... Mm -hmm. Very, very, very thin legs, mm -hmm. just tiny. Everything about her was tiny. And that was actually one of the storylines going forward in her life because within the next couple of years, her body changed tremendously. Mm -hmm. She retired right away from competitive skating and suffered some significant injuries because all of a sudden she was trying to jump with 30 or 40 more pounds on mm -hmm. her. And that became more apparent. But of course, at this point in the creation of the movie, that hadn't happened yet. And they also glanced over, I'm glad you mentioned the injuries because they glanced over, she had had a more horrific back and neck injury prior to the crash in the Olympics. And, you know, I thought, well, if they were going to show that crash, why wouldn't they show another significant episode in her life that kind of affected her moving forward. It was too bad. I, w I would have liked to see the post-Olympic Oksana as well because her life changed so dramatically. And like you said, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Ukraine really not getting the resources to allow these people to train properly, you know, a lot of the athletes left. I mean, they ended up on Oksana and her coach Galina and Victor Petrenko. They all ended up in Sinsbury, Connecticut, which is my hometown state. And they were training here, you know, as professionals. And then, you know, unfortunately, she got involved in alcoholism and who knows? I mean, having money, you know, after the Olympics, getting the endorsements and doing all the skating shows that probably went to her head. And it would have been interesting having, to see. And having no one. I mean, that was one thing the right. movie did portray accurately. She lost her grandparents. She lost her mother. She left home. She really didn't have anyone. And to be 16, 17 years old mm -hmm. and an Olympic gold medalist in figure skating, where you are held up as an ice princess and become the face of the sport, to have nobody who can say no to you, no wonder she got into trouble. Though, nice story is she's now happily married with a daughter and, and she turned her life around. But there was a few years there where she was a tabloid headline. But yeah, I think this movie kind of left out the makings of that, not just because of time, but also because, like you said, it was her story. Mm -hmm. It was what she wanted to present to the world. Right. And probably after the Olympics, sold these movie rights so quickly in order to capitalize, capitalize. on the payday. Sure. Sure. With having no money, but also probably didn't have much in the way of financial education, financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So you're making these decisions and, and it's no wonder. But her not having, getting all this money and all this fame and everybody demanding of your time and trying to cash in, even though I'm sure her coach probably helped her as best she could, there's only so much you can do with a teenager at that time. And now refresh my memory. I mean, I remember... During the Olympics, they talked a lot about her and Victor Petrenko being very close. This movie really didn't show any bond 
really between the two. I mean, it showed them meeting and kind of awkwardly being in the same room at the same time, but they really didn't show any camaraderie or any kind of sense of a relationship between the two of them. So that was kind of disappointing because I knew in, that they had had a relationship together. Was it more brother sisterly or just more a professional admiration for each other? And they really didn't go into that in the movie. Well, it was problematic that the actor playing Victor Petrenko looked about 40. <laughs> I think he's supposed to be less than, he's only about seven, I think, years older than Shay. So she was, say, 15, and he was in his early 20s when they, they meet. Mm -hmm. And it they described it at the time as like a big brother who looks out for her and, and mm -hmm. takes care of her. And they performed together for years and worked together in Simsbury and were at one point very close. And Oksana recently has come out with a lot of anti-Victor Petrenko statements because of his support of the Russian establishment and his mm. continued performing in Moscow. So the fact that she's come out so strongly against him tells me that they were very close at one mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But maybe they were concerned about it looking creepy to an American audience. Maybe. I think it would have worked if they did it in a certain way. I mean, the coach and her relationship could have been creepier if they did it a certain way, I, I felt like there was a loving bond between the two of them and kind of like he was her father figure that she never had. So that was portrayed, I thought, really well, actually, in the movie. You know, whether that was the true case or not in real life, who knows? But but I like that relationship dynamic. They didn't really I couldn't really tell from the movie how good or bad or indifferent she felt about Galena and her being her coach, but it was, yeah, it was just very stilted. The writing just didn't feel like it really pushed the story along. And, and it was, it was really sad because, you know, you have this amazing athlete and what she accomplished at such a young age is so incredible. And you really didn't get a sense of the enormity of what she did. And also at this time, there was the whole controversy with Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. They didn't even go into that. And that was the biggest controversy in, in skating right up until the Olympics. So it was just kind of odd that the skating really took a back seat. One thing that I did notice that Jill will love was Galena was never without her stopwatch. I, love that. <laughs> I honestly have never seen a figure skating coach who was so attached to the stopwatch like don't you use cues in the music isn't the music cut to a certain amount of time what was she doing with the stopwatch must have been like timing her thing yeah how long Oksana was taking to do it where could we cut some time where can we add some time how much is this section how much is that? I don't know they could have taken all of the stopwatch <laughs> footage. Motion, uh, footage and taken that out and made a whole scene with Victor Petrenko <laughs> that would have tied it all together. The other thing that they could have cut out of the script was how many times everybody said Oksana. <laughs> it was in every other line. Were they worried we were going to forget who the movie was about? <laughs> Nobody has used my name in my entire life as many times as I heard this girl's name in this movie. Maybe they liked saying it. <laughs> Although they did I mean pepper the script with enough Russian sounding phrases and Ukrainian maybe endearments, but yeah, it was disappointing. I mean, they had the tropes, I mean, all over the place. And they had the crash with the blood on the ice. Though that was accurate. That, that was, was accurate. A, well, that was wait. a very bloody crash. But how bad was it? Was it? Yes. They, it it really was that bad. It. I had forgotten about it. And after I saw that section of the movie, I said, how could I have forgotten about this? And went and looked at the foot and it was actually she needed stitches in her leg there was blood on the ice and there was question as to whether she was even going to skate the long program mm -hmm. so it was as serious as they do make it out to be well 
Well, wait. Okay, so I also went looking for this as well. <laughs> I could not. And I and they did say, oh, it sounded like she needed about three stitches. And I know there was blood on the ice, but it wasn't like her whole shin was gashed. <laughs> <laughs> and you could almost see the blood spurting out <laughs> in this movie. Yeah, I wouldn't think from her limping as badly as she was the day before, she would be all better with seemingly no treatment in time for her Olympic performance. And when they summoned her to the ice for the her Olympic gold medal performance, why was she still in the dressing room? That doesn't happen. You're right next to the ice. Like that kind of stuff was like, ah, it's so lazy. I mean, did anybody who knew knows about what goes on? No kiss and cry. Nothing. No ice skating. No crowd clapping. Like nothing. No and no little little skaters picking up the flowers and the baubles and the Lillehammer stuffed animals. I mean, bummer. And figure skaters. (laughs) wearing their skates at all times. Right. There was a lot of walking around the rink <laughs> in their skates and walking around backstage. And I'm saying to myself, this woman is not... At one point when Oksana is first meeting Galena, the wife of the coach brings over a cup of tea to Galena wearing her skates. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was that the and wife thinking, of the coach? The woman with the mushroom hair? Katya. That was his wife. That was... Well... The woman who worked with him yes. was his wife. I just oh, made the assumption okay. that that's who that was supposed oh, to be. okay. The other thing, also unrealistic, what was Oksana wearing in practice? Like, everybody else is in, like, sweaters and sweatpants, and she has full-blown costumes on. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was dress rehearsal. But why was everybody else not in that uh. dress rehearsal? Yeah, because they do a dress rehearsal, but... And also, speaking of costumes, Soviet Ukraine French teachers had access to some very high quality fabric to make (laughs) their daughter's costumes. She did. Those costumes that the mother was making look like Vera Wang special. (laughs) I mean, they were very, very expensive, fancy fabrics. And not just on hers, on all of the girls. And I'm thinking... Yes, everybody makes their own dresses. That was a nice thing. But the elaborate quality of that was a little questionable. Yeah, I needed more Olympics. I needed something. Not just a picture at the front of a snowy village that said Lillehammer. Oh, the stock footage. The stock footage. The stock footage. Lillehammer and for Prague where the worlds were. Oh, well, I was losing it anyway through the whole movie, (laughs) but that just got me. But I mean, really, they probably could not film anything that looked Olympic because maybe they could not get access to a hockey stadium like where the Penguins would play because it was probably too expensive. And if you went out into the arena, like when we saw, they actually showed audience for what the national competition or was it the one before it was just like people were in a a hockey rink that was where the kids would play like a barn yeah (laughs) yeah it was disappointing i mean looking at other movies that we've seen like the tanya harding story you know or eddie the eagle or some of the other ones that portrayed them building up to their olympic moments you know and then you see this movie and you're like oh well her olympic movement moment was not even shown <laughs> so that was but kind I of a, a disappointment mama. she did it though i did it mama but it was a nice way to end it the way that they did with it was the, the real oksana performing that that's one like short program which is still one of the best short programs ever no i'm glad they included her in the end because i thought that was a really good way to end it because it just shows you her artistry and how good she really was but you know if you finish last it does not make a difference (laughs) oksana (laughs) oksana have fun oksana And what about Yuri? What happened to poor Yuri? Poor Yuri. I do not know what happened to Yuri. <laughs> Yuri also did miss like a couple of minutes because I was trying to back up to because I could not believe the words I heard coming out of Yuri's mouth. 
<laughs> they were so stilted. And it was almost as if, did you get Ukrainian actors who could magically shake their accents and sound American, <laughs> but they're speaking what English they would be <laughs> speaking and because it would be stilted. <laughs> I mean, poor Yuri. I, it was almost like, wait, where does he come from? What is he doing? They cut so much. And then by the end, when you're like, okay, we're getting to the Olympics and we're spending like five minutes looking at the moon, you're just like, <laughs> oh, oh, you ran out of money. And I said to Ben, I know they usually fi shoot films out of order, but did they shoot this one in chronological order and then get to the big part and realize, oh, we have no money to film this, so let's <laughs> shove her in the hotel room, have her look at the moon for a while, <laughs> rewrite this. But she's talking to Mama. I get, I get it. I get it. <laughs> but I, d I enjoyed it in a way because it was so bad it was good <laughs> but if you want to say quality of a movie not the greatest not yeah poor Oksana she needs, <laughs> she needs a good telling of her life go ahead Jill start writing the screenplay right, <laughs> well well Fran that was that I mean that was fun I, I will say it was a fun way to spend an afternoon if you go it was with, like, fun no I like I love I think the grandmother on the ice was my favorite scene because she went from barely holding on and gripping that poor kid for dear life to like almost doing like jumps on the ice and, and cajoling the poor little girl to come and the kid kept on falling on her took us. <laughs> it wasn't a very graceful start to her ice skating career. If that's the way she started out. Babushka said, come, Oksana, come, <laughs> Oksana, have fun. Well, I will say if you follow us on Twitter, you might be seeing a few screenshots of Coach Galena <laughs> with her dazed looks, her arched eyebrow. <laughs> I did a lot of screen capping. <laughs> Almost immediately, I wish we could have done this like DVD commentary style. And oh, like Mystery Theater gone. 2000? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. We would have been brutal, I think. It would have gotten a little ugly. Maybe for the patrons, we'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Fran, what do we have next? So up next, we have the movie called Over the Limit. And this is the story of the Russian rhythmic gymnastics team from 2016. I'm looking forward to this because as a documentary, I think it will probably reinforce what we think about the Russian system and not the Americanized version of the Russian system that we saw here. I love rhythmic gymnastics as well. So this should be really, hopefully, an interesting kind of insider's look into what it takes, especially from that point of view. And we'll give it a go and see what we think. Excellent. Well, Fran, thank you so much for being here. Fun time as always. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Fran. As we mentioned, the next selection for Movie Club is Over the Limit, the 2017 film about rhythmic gymnast Margarita Mamoun. We will have you that we will have that for you toward the end of the year. I am excited about that because I think the coaching depiction will be slightly more true to life, especially since it's a documentary. Well, we'll find out if anybody gets yelled at or things thrown at them. I, I do not see this coach going, Margarita. Margarita. Like Do it for your mother. <laughs> Feel it in your soul. Yeah, no. But it was fun to see hints of Lilla Hummer 1994 in this film. I'm posting a bang picture. <laughs> I will be posting a picture of myself from 1994. <gasps> so look oh, for that on our Instagram okay. page, okay. Flame Alive Pod. Speaking of Lillehammer, it is time to vote for our historic Olympics for next year. And as always, the listeners choose which games we focus on. So you will be choosing between Chamonix 1924, which is the very first Winter Olympics. It will be the 100th anniversary of those games next year. Sarajevo 1984, which will be 40th anniversary. And then a Lillehammer 1994, which is the 30th anniversary. We did a poll on Twitter already, and that closed. But you can go to our Facebook group, Keep the Flame Alive podcast group. And also on the page, correct? Yes. There are polls there. You can cast your vote. 
We're going to leave voting open until the 10th of September. So get there and cast your vote. How is it going overall? It is very tight. The top two right now are 94 and 24, and they're only separated by two votes. So every vote counts right now. Right. Do you want us to go with the OG games, or do you want us to go to one of the most beloved games of all time, Lillehammer? This is close. It is tight. It's going to come down to the finals. Also, another big announcement. We are excited to announce that we will be at Olympin's 2023 memorabilia show. This will take place October 13th through the 15th at the Hotel MDR in Marina del Rey, California. So if you are in Southern California, please stop on by the show. We would love to meet you and maybe you will be able to get your hands on our 2024 pin. I'm excited to get my hands on the 2024 (laughs) pin. I haven't seen them yet. So this is going to be cool. I've seen the design. (laughs) <laughs> but not the final product. We will be there with our fancy table mm-hmm. and some and toys we got at Beijing. And microphones. We'll, and microphones. <laughs> yep. We will absolutely be there. And we'd love to say hi in person. <laughs> Welcome to Shuklasan. Now it's the time of the show where we check in with our team at Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests of the show and listeners who make up our citizenship of Shuklasan. We have a ton of results. I know World Athletic Championships has just been the gift that keeps on giving. Deanna Price got third in the hammer throw, and that's huge for her because she's been suffering through a lot of illness and injury the past two years. I was so excited to see this. I was so excited that she was excited and that her coach slash husband were so excited. I mean, they are thrilled that the setbacks were just hopefully all in the past and that she looks healthy. Now, so I know we just want a healthy Olympics for Deanna because right. that right. has not happened yet. Right. Race walker Evan Dunphy got fourth in the 35 kilometer. He also got a season's best time with that. And he said he was in the mix for the medals, but his hamstring flared up with three kilometers to go. And he just couldn't hang in there and try to nab that podium place. He was disappointed, but it, He's had some ups and downs. He's been very frank on social media about this. And it's been very interesting to see the wide range of emotions that can happen because he's happy about a season's best. He's kind of relieved that he still gets funding, which is huge. That was also on the line if he did not perform well. But I think it's frustrating to want to be on the podium and just not be able to get there quite yet. Yeah, he's had a lot of fourths in big Mm -hmm. races, and that's the always a bridesmaid frustration that Mm -hmm. he feels. But we're proud of him. We're very proud for him. him. Katie Moon tied for gold in the pole vault. She and Australia's Nina Kennedy could have had a jump off, but they decided it was actually not safe for them. They both posted about that they were feeling quite fatigued. And concerned about injury. So they had cleared 4.9 meters, but they failed uh, all three attempts at 4.95. So they are co-world champions. Also very nice. And Katie Moon, a second year with more controversy on social media of a lot of armchair athletes wondering why they didn't have a jump off. And she having to explain, it it sounded like it was very hot and humid in Budapest. You don't see how the heat affects you when you're sitting at home, maybe in your air conditioning. So that was really interesting to see her have to educate people again on this is the situation and this is why we did what we did. Because there were a lot of people calling for, no, you should have a jump off and one one champion. We don't like these tie gold medals just because you decide you don't want to jump anymore. But like she and Nina both said, safety. That was a big deal. They're not going to sacrifice their careers for your irritation at a co-gold medalist. Right. Calm down. Or life. Yeah. I mean, we've seen a lot of those stories that are not cool. Para power lifter Louise Sugden got sixth in the up to 86 kilometer cl- kilogram class at the para power lifting world championship. She has achieved her spot in the top eight Paris games rankings. Oh my gosh. She was so thrilled. It was yeah. so exciting to see this performance from her. And it just, it makes me so happy because she has also gone through a lot. Yeah. I mean, coming back from some really serious surgery and she had to drop out of Commonwealth last year and just to see her competing again at all 
is no joke. I mean, this has not been fun for her, but she did it with such a smile on her face as she always does and with such joy. I mean, she's just so much fun to watch compete because she she loves doing it and it's clear. And that's why we get excited about this. So yay, Louise. And finally, this is a little bit of a bonus for everybody today. So Shuk Flastani, video journalist, Sean Callahan, or should I say multi Emmy award winning Sean right. Callahan, just got back from Paris and he stopped by to tell us what the atmosphere is like in the city. He has some great little bits of tips and insights. So take a listen to that. Sean Callahan, welcome yeah. back. It's been a while. One of our early Shuk Flastanis. You've just been on vacation in Bonjour. Paris. <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> what, what do you see? What was going on? Tell us all about it. Well, from an Olympic standpoint, you could see there was a, a lot of, I want to say construction, but renovations. There was a lot of stuff and they were posting saying, hey, we're making this nicer because we have the Olympics coming up. We did see that around a lot of the central tourist district. There was a few train lines closed. I don't know if that was just for normal maintenance or if they were being heavy this summer so that next summer they didn't have any maintenance. So that, that was tough to tell. But in like the public spaces in some of the parks, in the, like the central tourist districts along the Seine, you did see stuff being renovated and it, they had placards on saying, Olympics is coming, sorry for the inconvenience right now. I think there was even, yeah, I think even a section near the Eiffel Tower, they were getting spruced up. And we're talking mid-August, 2023. Yes, this was right. literally a week, two weeks ago. The uh, only place I really saw the rings, we were actually in a cab coming across town and I, I spotted them, the Paralympic at the Olympic logo. And I was looking on my maps like, what is that building? Because every building in, in, in downtown Paris looks amazing. And it was actually with the city hall. They had big rings and the Paralympic logo in front. People would take the pictures, the selfies. And then over near the Eiffel Tower, they had a countdown clock and a flame that people could take pictures with. All right. They just, at one year to go, they launched the official countdown clock. The Grand Palais was also closed for renovations in preparations for the games. But yeah, you could see there was activity going across the city. I did find a swag store. I figured it's the Olympics. They love their merchandise. I figured there had to be something built up. And so I, I did some searching on the website and found they had two stores, went to one of them. You know, your basics, I'm sure they're going to increase what you can get exponentially. But yeah, there was a constant flow of people in and out of that store, including myself. I had to get myself some pins. What did you walk away with? I'm a basic person. I go for the pins. They had some there. Are and, the fringes and they... better in person? It's interesting. They had, they, had, <laughs> they had about every plush size from keychain to body size of the mascot. All the mascots have had definitely a, a unique look to them. So par for the course. Parlay for the course. <laughs> <laughs> Where bones but did you stay? We were in a, hotel, a beautiful hotel in like a little residential neighborhood, about 15 minute walk from the Eiffel Tower, but it was in a, I said, it wasn't touristy. It was nice and quiet. So it was a, a lovely section to stay in near the Metro. Um, we could watch it. We could walk to the Eiffel Tower and yeah, it was taking our daughter to France for the first time and she loved it. And the first time she saw the Eiffel Tower was grinning from ear to ear. So giddy. What would you recommend from your travels for those people who are going and want to see other stuff besides the Olympics? What else did you do? We did some of the museums. It'll be tough knowing what the access was. We went to the Musée Lingerie, which is where the water lilies of Monet are. That is going to be right. That's right next to the Place de Concorde, where I think they're going to oh, have wow. like the three on three. Go into what they should see. Thinking about that, the venues are going to be amazing. They are going to be iconic. Being at the Eiffel Tower and be like, they're going to have the beach volleyball in the shadow of the Eiffel Tower. The visuals are going to be stunning. Taekwondo in the Grand Palais. Amazing. I mean, having the break dancing, the three on three basketball, I, I, there's one or two else, others that are going to be in the Plaza Concord. Yeah, BMX. This, that's right. The settings are going to be fantastic. And let alone whatever they decide to do with the opening ceremony. We did a cruise down the river and all I could think about is this is going to be epic in terms of the visuals, the uniqueness of it. So I definitely think just Paris is beautiful for anyone who hasn't been to the city. Go, go in a non-Olympic year. Like the Olympics changes the city. 
just with you know, the venues, the traffic, the coordinations, it's not going to feel the same during the Olympics. It's going to be amazing, but the feel of the city is definitely going to, it's going to be incredible. Even anyone watching at home, I think will, you know, get a feel for this and, you know, what the Parisians are doing in France for the venues is, I think, going to be iconic. Anything that people should skip? The Louvre. Really? Yes. I wouldn't have gone if it wasn't for my daughter wanting to see the Mona Lisa. It is, it's too crowded. It, I mean, even with time tickets, you can't enjoy anything. You can't, we were trying to get to the Mona Lisa. It's, it's packed, but there's all this amazing artwork in there and you can't, it's too crowded to enjoy it. The only part of the Louvre you can get is the, basically the further away from the Mona Lisa you get, the less crowded it gets. So we actually were in some sections that just felt like a normal art museum. There were people there, but you could move around, you could stop. There are these grand halls you go to through with amazing works of art and you just, it just too, you can't enjoy it. And we were at the Musée Lingerie. There were people there, you know, it was a time ticket. There were people there, but you could be in the rooms with Monet's water lilies. There was a lot of other people, but you could enjoy them. You could stop, you could look at them. You could even sit down on the bench. I just feel like half of the Louvre um, where the you know, Mona Lisa is and the Venus de Milo statue are overcrowded, unfortunately. How many baguettes and croissants did you have? Well, I haven't eaten carbs since 2019, except for the past nine days in France. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't usually eat bread except when in France, so. Beaucoup. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> but, oh, the wine. Oh, all the French wine we drank was, it was so inexpensive, too. It's like, we're looking at, we're looking at the menus, we're like, Four euros for a glass of Bordeaux. So from your cameraman's eye, I know you're saying a lot of the yes. venues are iconic. What excites you the most? And what scares you the most as to what can go wrong? The opening ceremony is going to be logistically difficult. It's a river, but I think they can pull it off. They wouldn't have done that if they didn't have some idea. And I think it's just going to be nothing we've ever seen before. I don't know if you've ever taken a trip down the river you just, it's like Notre Dame, the Louvre, the Musée d'Orsay, the Grand Palais. It's so visual. And the fact that so many more people are going to get to experience it than normally would get to experience an opening ceremony, I think. It's going to be one that people remember. I think the venue-wise, beach volleyball. I mean, how can you have a location more iconic than the Eiffel Tower that is instantly recognizable around the globe? And to have that event taking place in the shadow of it like nothing we've ever seen before. And that's it. I think just being so instantly recognizable. What are you excited about watching next year? It, presumably, oh, I'm excited you time... watching you two travel around <laughs> Paris on the, on the transportation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be sitting there with my bowl of popcorn. <laughs> How else are you going to do today? <laughs> I think that's kind of how. A lot of people felt after a couple of experiences. <laughs> yes, I, I think you guys should get air tags and give the <laughs> and give the patrons the link to watch. <laughs> a special Kickstarter fee. You know, there you go. There you go. It's funny you for... say that because my husband did have an air tag for me, and a couple of times I did get a text. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm fine. I just somewhere. Well, I... I think any of the events that are going to be outside amongst the city. I mean, gymnastics is always a big thing. Swimming is always a big thing. Those are going to be inside arenas. Yeah, they'll show the bump shots of the outside of the stadium or the arena, or whatever. But I think it's going to be like your BMX, your breakdancing, your beach volleyball. The ones that are amongst the city and outside where from the camera shots that you can just kind of get a feel for you are. I think that's what's going to be really cool to watch when you were doing your boat tour down the Seine, would you did you look at the water and think i would swim in that i didn't think that i mean i just gotten off a, an overnight <laughs> flight too so i was a little i, I mean there, there was no thought i never like would look at it and say let me go swimming in there or not and just <laughs> what was the weather like for you perfect oh yay yeah it was like 70s sunny like i was wearing slacks and a t-shirt and just not hot nice. so yeah we 
hit it perfectly in terms of the weather. Nice. You know, nice. eating at cafes every night outside. And that's probably good that they have calmer weather this year so that people don't necessarily talk about it so much. Yeah. I mean, I think they did have a heat wave, but I think that was more in the south of France and south southern Europe. But yeah, we hit amazing weather. So hopefully that hopefully they have the same weather for the Olympics. Did you go anywhere else in France, Sean? Yeah, we went to the beautiful mountain town of Chamonix. Home and, of the very first Olympics. And I was trying to figure out where they went skiing, being the skier myself for the Olympics. So I'll definitely be interested to see. This is a plug for you guys to cover that. <laughs> but no, it was literally storybook beautiful. I fell in love with the town. I've done a lot of skiing. And so just being in the mountains. But these were just massive mountains that just went up from the valley. And it's like they took a little neighborhood in Paris and just dropped it in. Wow. Is there anything there that ha still has some kind of Olympic connection to it? There is a museum in town that looks like it's under renovation. You could see, I was looking for it and I could find a site and they said it's closed for renovation. I think they would have stuff in there from what it looked like. I could, the website wasn't the greatest, but that's probably where they had some stuff. And I mean, they even have the signs in town pointing to where it is, but it was under, it's been under renovation. So hopefully that can open up again. I mean, they have some ski jumps there, but I don't think those were what they used if they even had ski jumping in 1926. So it, it's tough to tell what what was used, because even the tram that went up to near the top of Mont Blanc, what they built back in the day when the Olympics were around is a different, totally even a different alignment than what they have now. I was trying to find some stuff myself. I didn't have that much time, but I was definitely like looking around for like what the trail maps were for skiing just because it's a totally different style of skiing than what we're used to in the in, in the US. It's just all very big and broad and you skiing you ski between ski areas as opposed to just being locked into one. So it was just trying to find that information to kind of match it up with what we were seeing in the summertime. But uh, it would have definitely been a pretty one to see. It was interesting that the quickest way to get to Chamonix was actually to go through Switzerland. Oh really? Yeah, we took the TGV to Geneva from Paris, and then we hopped on a bus. But it's like an hour away by bus from Geneva. It's, that, it's pretty close. Do you think that that valley could hold the Olympics again? Because they've been talking about bidding for 2030. I mean, I know there's a bunch of different towns there. It has to be like a regional one. I mean, because it was crazy. You, know, you saw the sign for like Albertville as well. Like you take this exit and you go down this road and you get to Albertville. They would have to be more of a regional I think aspect of it was just how big, I mean, there's not enough hotels in Chamonix. Like the skiing in that spot, I think maybe up the valley comes all the way down to the valley, but most of the skiing, you, you take the gondolas or the trams up a couple thousand vertical feet. And then that's where the ski areas are on the top of the mountain. And they might have one trail that comes to the bottom. So I think there were some other mountains further up the valley. It's because you'd want the skiing to come down to the valley to have you stand for the racing. And I know they do race, so it would be tough to do a modern Olympics. There's no, definitely no room in Chamonix for any of the arena mm -hmm. sports. I don't know where the closest sliding center is to that. Yeah, it would be, I think it'd be super difficult. And not knowing what's in the region, once you get a little bit outside of Chamonix, I, I don't know how you would do that. I just don't have enough information. Yeah, I think, I think we may be leaning towards Chamonix because then we can take a side trip. Yeah, I, I think right. so. it's it really easy to get to from Paris. I think it'd be nice and relaxing. And Lausanne is just a, a hop, skip, and a jump yes. in there. That's yeah, right. I mean, yeah, just hop on the trains. You can just do the Olympic circuit. If you're really feeling up to it, go to Innsbruck. Just keep staying on the train. <laughs> <laughs> Tour d'Alpe. You could scout Milan, Cortina while you're there. You got two weeks. The trains are efficient. <laughs> Chamonix, Albertville, Innsbruck, Milan, Cortina. Oh, might as well hit Torino while you're there too. I, I, just, I, just, I just filled Olympic you two weeks up. <laughs> right? We have our new Olympic travel agent now. Games travel with Sean Callahan. <laughs> Tour director extraordinaire. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's Dominique. Pleasure. All of these Shuklastanis are getting ready for Paris 2024, and so are we. The Summer Olympics and Paralympics are less than a year away, and we are hard at work getting ready to bring you the best stories you can't get anywhere else. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I just think our, our toilet problems 
are not. Is that really the best stories? Well, as Sean said, he's going to sit on the couch and listen to what adventures we have in Paris. I mean, this is a whole other level because now in Beijing, we didn't have a lot of people around. And yet mm-hmm. somehow we managed to find trouble. <laughs> Imagine what I can do on a crowded metro system. It's going to be fun. <laughs> oh, boy. But it's only going to be fun if we can get there. And we really need your help to make this trip happen. It's an expensive endeavor. We will be there for two months, basically, doing a lot of preparation, long days, And it's a very expensive endeavor. So later this fall, we will be launching a Kickstarter. And the last time you all really came through for us, oh my gosh, we really could not have done a Beijing without you because that was a trip. Thank you, COVID restrictions. But Paris will be expensive in its own way. So we'll have a Kickstarter fundraiser for that with exciting supporter giveaways. I'm thrilled with what we're coming up with. So look forward to that. And in the meantime, you can become a Patreon patron and get bonus episodes about Paris 2024 and rules changes that you will notice and how there's some sports that will have significant changes next year. So you can learn all about that now and get ready. You can give back to your favorite Olympic and Paralympic podcast at flamealivepod.com slash support. No. Just a little update from USA Today's Christine Brennan. She broke that the 2022 U.S. Olympic figure skating team sent a letter to the Court of Arbitration for Sport to request an observation seat at the closed hearing of Camilla Valieva, which is set for September 26th through 29th. Oh, boy. So at least we have a date for this hearing. Finally. 475 years later. Right. So that's next step in the process. Have not heard back whether or not Cass will let somebody into this, but obviously the teams are frustrated and would like some closure on this. Ooh la la, c'est bon fait. <laughs> Your Duolingo is going well. <laughs> I am working hard because I am going to be on the metro and goodness knows where I'm going to end up. So I better be able to ask. (laughs) Ue la stadium. (laughs) What you need to know is Ue she Netherlands because the team NL house has been announced. It will be in Parc de la Villette in northern Paris. And so that's a huge park. And it sounds like a lot of hospitality houses will be there. They will be ticketed because Team Netherlands House is a high demand house. It also has a reputation as being a big party. So could be exciting. Ticket prices have yet to be announced. So if you're going and Team Netherlands House is on your list, Get a ticket in advance so that you can make sure you can get in on the day you want. If there are still day of tickets available, they will be on sale online, but don't expect that to happen. They will be open for both the Olympics and Paralympics. Are you planning to go? Yeah, because the Dutch King might be there. Oh, oh, that's right. Oh, oh. <laughs> you forget how much I love their that royal family. <sighs> Well, you know what? We should make a royalty bingo card for you so you can check off, like, did I, were the royals in attendance from, just name your country. Will they be there? Princess Anne, Queen Maxima, Crown Princess Mary. (laughs) I have a whole list of people I want to see. Their security will never let me anywhere near them. That's fine. But I'll see them from a distance (laughs) and I will be hitting that curtsy. I promise you, royal families, I know how to curtsy. We have the official one year to go celebration for the Paralympics. Paris announced the session schedule so that you can start planning for what tickets you want to buy. Tickets go on sale October 9th, as do hospitality packages. So that will be exciting. Day before tickets go on sale, Paris will celebrate its second Paralympic day. This year, it will be a Place de la République. And it will have numerous sport demonstrations, including one from Shuklastani archer Matt Stutzman. I hope they they do something like he has to hit the apple. 
Oh, I'm like, sure they will. Let's play it up. Let's go whole hog into this. NBC has released its broadcast plans for the Paralympics. So I am excited, yet I have a little bit of trepidation with this. They are planning over 140 hours of television coverage. This will be on NBC, USA, and CNBC. USA is going to be your main network for the Paralympics. They will have the live coverage of the competition day. NBC coverage, not so much. They're going to have just nine hours of coverage on NBC. Six of those will be in primetime. They're going to focus on top stories and moments of the games, as well as athlete profiles and interviews. So if you want that kind of stuff, look for NBC. It, I am bummed about this because for people who get over-the-air television still, or and I know a lot of people do streaming, but it really sounds like they've cut exposure to the Paralympics for a section of audience. Whether or not it's big, I don't know. Yes. And in general, though, NBC has cut sports other than, you know, kind of the big time American sports from its main network overall. So if you want to see anything but football or baseball, you got to go to Peacock or one of their sister channels. It's just kind of what they're doing with sports. Speaking of that, Peacock, there will be over 1,500 hours of live streaming on Peacock through NBC Universal. This is planned to include every sport on the Paralympic program, which that I'm excited about because last time, and we talked about this with Alexis Schaefer, that they did not have three sports in Tokyo because they were not broadcast at all for anybody. And we had a lot of feed beefs then we did it was a lot of for tokyo it was very difficult being able to watch things we knew about and wanted to watch never mind just discovering it right so hopefully this means fewer feed beefs for all of you 1500 hours is a lot so i'm excited about that it balances out the nbc coverage but i do feel like nbc is downplaying the paralympics in a way that they're missing some exposure to somebody. I I don't know. Is NBC's audience old and they think, oh, these people don't want to watch it? But, you know, that's something you watch with your grandkids, maybe. I don't know. It just, it feels like everything else with television, we're getting so segmented and Mm -hmm. it's making it more difficult for that discovery. You know, what we talk about when we were kids, we both kind of stumbled upon the television coverage. And that's not how the next generation is discovering the Paralympics. I think they're discovering it through social media and then seeking it out so that the athletes themselves are now burdened with creating stories that then people want to watch them. But on the flip side, you've got people like Hunter Woodhall and Chuck Aoki who are becoming social media darlings and getting the exposure. NBC is also doing a lot of stuff on the Today Show. Yes. So rather than focusing on airing the sports themselves, they're focusing on the athletes and their stories and trying to hook people that way. Because Chuck was on the Today Show. So nice. I'm, I think they're trying a very, very different approach, which I'm glad to see because the approach the past two times has not been working to get enough new fans to the Paralympics. So they're going with, let's hook it with the people. Because that's what we, we love the sports and the people. And if you can hook it with the people and then get people (laughs) to watch wheelchair rugby, I'm with you. Let's try a new approach. Well, we will see how this works. What else is exciting? Okay, so every event is going to be closed captioned. There's going to be audio descriptions of all linear programming. So that's good. They're keeping up that accessibility factor that we saw in Tokyo, which was really awesome. But for the first time, they will have on-site hosts, and they will also be bringing the largest on-site reporter crew they've had yet at a Paralympics. Outstanding. So I am very hopeful that we will see Carolyn Mano again. She was great. The fact that they're going to be on site this time makes a difference. And they're they're not going to be sitting in Stanford. Mm -hmm. Stanford is lovely. Don't get me wrong. 
we know from our own experience being there, you are able to share something very different with the audience. It'll also be interesting to see how many Olympics hosts and reporters will be on site this time because the whole, well, we cut back for Tokyo, we cut back for Beijing, partially forced, but then partially because, oh, look at this. We don't need to have on-site people anymore because we've got technology. And we've talked about how that, that you lose something with that. Right. And Ollie told us, though, that when he's covering something, he is watching the monitor. I know, but you still so, get that you still get that energy and yes. the crowd reaction. And it's just different because television flattens things out in a way that it doesn't happen on in live. And we will be available to give height perspectives on everything cuz I'll just stand next to people and send a picture. <laughs> cuz I am 5 foot flat. It is very easy to say <laughs> Is this one Allison? Is this one and a third Allison? So I'll let you know how tall people are. Excellent. It's the Shukflastani measuring system. We have metric <laughs> imperial and Shukflastani. Okay. And then eventing had an operational test event at Versailles. And according to Horse and Hound magazine, it went well. Versailles is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so they do have to be careful how, with how they manage the event and everything has to be kind of just so and it has to go back to being the same way it was beforehand. The cross-country course is going to feature two pontoon crossings. Oh my gosh, I have just found like five things I want to learn about when it comes to eventing in the cross-country course. The pontoons feature a series of tanks which are filled to, with water and sunk to a specified level. The structure is anchored to the base of the canal. The surface of the pontoon has matting and sand footing for the horses. This is intense. I think we'll be fine as long as they don't try and decorate the course the way they did in Tokyo. <laughs> with that terrifying sumo wrestler's bottom. That was show jumping. That was show jumping, not eventing. <laughs> I'm still that saying that seems to work well. The horses were able to go over it with no problems. So that is good to hear that things are going well in the equestrian field. And that is going to do it for this week. Let us know what you remember from Lilla Hammer 1994. You can connect with us on Twitter slash X and Instagram at Flame Alive Pod. Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. And don't forget to get our weekly newsletter filled with other fun stories about this week's episode. You can sign up for that at flamealivepod.com. And do not forget to vote in our Facebook poll to choose what our Winter Olympics history moment will be next year. Next week, we will be talking with author Stephen Lang about his new book, Long Run to Glory, the story of the first Olympic women's marathon in 1984. So get excited about that. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.